Hello, welcome to this video. On this video, I would like to discuss the shock of the new. Art not there to entertain you. Not art not there to pass time. Oh, bloody hell. <coughs> right, let's have another go. Right, so. Hello, welcome to this video, and on this video I would like to talk about the shock of the new. Art that's not there just to entertain you, or while away a few hours. But art that is there to challenge you, right? Art which is there to show a different route, route a different, a different, <laughs> a different way of seeing the world. Something that challenges you. Um, something that sounds like this. And so... <laughs> I wanted to do the weirdest start I've ever done to a video. Uh, and that was just it. Um, it usually takes me a little bit of time to get going on these videos. Often I have to get into the zone and, and I do have to have a few run-ups that I, have to, I usually do edit those bits out. But I left them in there. So you could see the inner workings of my video. You could see that sort of alienation effect that I was talking about last week. Uh, on a Sunday, because Sunday afternoons have been my, become my philosophical um, 20 minutes where I talk about a something a little bit wider. So, what just emanated from my mouth, right? It was an album by a guy called Peter Brooks, but it was in fact this album here. Look at that artwork, right? It simply says machine gun, and then it's got the definition of a machine gun automatic gun for fast continuous firing and then it says Peter Broatsman Octet. Awful graphics, cheap, this is the back, minimal, you know. Um, this, as you probably just heard, is one of the most challenging albums you could listen to, right? It is not an easy listen. Peter Broatsman died uh, last week at the age of 83. A completely terrifying, uncompromising, creative maverick on the music scene, right? 83 years old he was, okay? In the 80s, I came across him in a band called Last Exit, which was Bill Laswell, um, Ronald Sean Jackson, Sonny Sharrock, and Peter Broatsman. Um, and the reason, the reason I knew about it, because this band had come to the UK to do a tour, and I, and I read a review, and the review wasn't, yeah, good or bad. You could tell the people just didn't know what to make of this, just cross between free jazz and, and like extreme noise metal, you know, just screaming at them for an hour and a half. They didn't understand, they just, what, what, what is this? It's a challenge, it's a challenge. Um, we're now in an age where the only surviving member now of Last Exit is Bill Laswell. And uh, poor old ba Bill Laswell is not, um, not that well. Um, he put a, a statement out when Peter Broatsman died last week where he said, um, I am now the last man standing and I still can't and I can't stand up properly myself, you know. So the, that generation that came up with an idea about what art is, it's not just there to entertain, it's there to create new ideas, new forms, to innovate, to challenge the audience, right? Is that idea now dying with the people that had that idea, right? In other words, is the idea of new now old? Is the idea of new now passé? Okay? It's a really interesting thought. Um, I had this thought about half an hour ago and I thought I've got to do a video on this. So I, I am just coming in here and talking to you straight off the top of my head. So I'm going to have to try and recall a lot of stuff because I really haven't researched this, right? Um, but I would like to go back a hundred and six years to 1917. In 1917, there was a European artist called uh, Marcel Duchamp. And Marcel Duchamp 
was at the forefront of this new wave in, um, in art, which we could call modernism. Modernism was uh, challenging a lot of the established ideas of what art is. Moving towards abstraction, uh, dealing with different subject matter. Um, Marcel Duchamp was a true revolutionary and he felt that um, art had just become owned by the academy. It had been owned by an educational elite. A little bit like some of the accusations I pointed at jazz now, right? So um, artists are talking to themselves. Normal people don't care about art. They're out doing their thing, you know. And so Marcel Duchamp, I think, decided, and this is my take on it. I, I was originally a painter and I did my degree in art and I've thought about this a lot. And I really think that this, the piece of um, artwork I'm about to tell you about is perhaps the most important piece of artwork in the 20th century. I think Marcel Duchamp wanted to tie up that academic elite intelligentsia into a conceptual knot, right? And the reason why he wanted to do that was then art, true creativity, would then channel its way out in the music of the people, which of course it did. Because if we sit back and look at the 20th century, as much as we may, may rave on about Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, right? The high point is Louis Armstrong, Little Richard, James Brown, Led Zeppelin. That's where the art is for me, okay? So how did he do this? And it's an incredibly clever piece of art. Marcel Duchamp set out to um, tie up that intelligentsia by um, creating a piece of art that questioned the very nature of what art is on absolutely every single level. And the way he did this was by taking a urinal, right? Something that you urinate into, and he placed it in an art gallery. He didn't sign it with his name. He signed it with the name R. Mutz. So he didn't sign it with his name. He stuck this in the art gallery and he didn't put the urinal the right way up. He lay it on its back. So he abstracted the urinal. Now, if you look at the history of this um, piece of work, there is a question of whether this actually was exhibited or whether this happened at all. And which urinal is the urinal? It's, uh, when you start to look at this piece of work, every single thing that you would try and encapsulate as being the art is being put under question, right? It's not just about the fact that, oh, you know, is it is, is a urinal? Is, is, is that something as low and base as that? Can that be considered art? Can it? It's not just that. Did it even exist? Where is it? Right? Who painted it? What does Armut mean? You know, is that part of the art? Because it's not the artist. Where's the artist's name? Is there an artist? Is there a piece of art? Is this art? What makes it art? Well, it's, it's art because it went in an art gallery. But did it even go in the art gallery? What is it? What is this thing? And I think if you look at contemporary art, and all those people standing there all proud that they are so cutting edge, they are still tied up in that knot right now. You know, they're still going, is this art? Is this art? Is this art? They're questioning the very nature of what art is. That has gone on for a hundred years, right? And once that happened, you know, the true creatives were allowed to go elsewhere. And if you look at the history of the 20th century, the groundbreaking stuff, the innovative stuff happened in film. It happened in jazz, in blues, in popular music, in all sorts of other places. And that was the art that formed our culture. That's where the, that is the art where the negotiation of what is good and bad and beautiful happened. Now, I'm not saying 20th century art didn't play its role. It did. It did without a doubt, but it was tied up in that conundrum um, created by Marcel Duchamp. Now, um, when you look at, say, actual painting, where it goes after that is it sort of, we go through a period of abstraction. And so um, you're no longer painting reality. What you are doing is you are creating a piece of art that exists in itself. It's not pointing to something out in the real world. 
it's a thing in itself. And that's the question there. And that's like a part of what Marcel Duchamp, you know, um, questioned with that or, or whatever he did. I don't even think he questioned. I think he quite knowingly knew <laughs> what he was doing. It's a work of genius, really, right? Uh, and then when we get to the 60s and we move from the sort of modernist period, which is really looking at the form of things, and then in the postmodernist period, we start to look at the content of things and question that, right? We see a flip in the arts from abstraction to sort of that pop art. Um, and it's the thing about the signature. Who is the artist? Are they an artist or are they not? Is the artist themselves the artist? You know, and so, you know, we get with Andy Warhol, you know, extremely long, badly filmed films of someone asleep and everyone goes oh my god this is shocking how can that is that a piece of art i can remember studying that at art college and a few years later sat there one night falling asleep myself with an episode of big brother on uh, and it was film of people being to, asleep and i thought well andy, well andy warhol got it right andy warhol got it right. all these great artists got it right all right because what these artists were doing they weren't just there to entertain you they were there to challenge you they were there to um that shock you, make you think a different way, okay? Now, what's interesting is when rock and roll comes out and then rock music, right? Pure rock and roll, the teenage rock and roll of the 50s is, is purely about shock, it's purely about a new, it's, it's visceral newness. It's a new generation coming up saying, we don't wanna know about this, we want this stuff, it's dangerous, it's exciting, they're singing about, you know, sex, they're singing about getting drunk, driving around in cars, it's fun, you know, um, it, it, that's what rock and roll is. And then, artists come along in the 60s, and I've spoken about Bob Dylan on this channel before, but Dylan really comes on and goes, yeah, but you know this could be really intelligent stuff. We can discuss much deeper things. We can challenge people on a much heavier level. And when Dylan starts to do that, and there's other artists that do that as well, and we see an explosion throughout the 60s of people questioning the very nature of what art is. Now, let's go back to this album here. This was made, I believe, in 1968. Uh, there'll be no date on here. Um, it says, yeah, recorded May 1968 by Gunther Zippelius at Lille Ull in Bremen. All right. Um, this album is... Like, it's like free jazz is free jazz. <laughs> if you've listened to Ascension by Coltrane or free jazz or Arba Ayla and you think that's out there, imagine inside that there's a there's a <laughs> the same jump again. This is musicians exploring the outer limits of what is um, tolerable musically. Peter Broatsman is. Uh, a saxophone player or was a saxophone player and he blows as hard and as loud as he possibly can for as long as he possibly can exploring the limits of the saxophone itself and exploring the limits of his endurance right it's an affront okay and then this album because of the nature of the way it was recorded it's not recorded well right it really does sound like somebody murdering a donkey whilst being recorded on an iPhone at 20 foot away, right? It's, that's the aesthetic. Now, when you listen to something like that, most listeners will go, well, this is pure noise. I could have done that. You know, you could have done it. That's the whole thing about art. You could have done it, but you didn't, did you? You didn't do it. Someone else did it. They had the idea to do it. Everyone can do stuff once it's been done. We can all do that, can't we? Okay? Um, we could have all thought of the uh, theory of relativity if we could have thought of it first. You know, we could have realised gravity existed like Isaac Newton when the apple bounced off his head. But we didn't, did we? All right? Peter Broatsman is in complete command. He knows what he's trying to do on that album. He knows what he's trying to do. Um, it's coming out of Europe in Paris in 1968. There were riots. People felt revolutionary. They wanted to tear down society and rebuild a new society. And they wanted to express that rage and anger. And in no place um, 
in, in, in art is that sort of anger expressed on this album. But I don't really think it is album anger. I think it's pure joy at being alive, right? It goes beyond anger. It's a primal scream of our existence. It's, it's, it's human beings going, we exist we're here, like it or not, you know, for all our good points, for all our bad points, we are here. We go to the toilet, right? We live, we die. Think about the urinal, <laughs> right? So there's all these meanings in there. Now, I believe that these ideas were so strong and revolutionary um, that they, they go into society and rock music and cinema, it makes a ton of money, doesn't it? And so the industries come in and go, oh, this is really good. This revolutionary stuff's really good, you know. And the big fat guys with the big fat cigars in the record companies in the 1960s are like, sign more of these weird hippies. It's making money. Go and find something weird, you know. Oh, we, I just saw this guy called Frank Zappa. He was, he's playing in this club. It was like bluesy, but weird. Sign him. Give him a ton of money. He can make a double album. Give him an orchestra. Just get it out there. We haven't got a clue what the kid's like, right? So that's, that's what I think happens is that the sort of corporate interests come in. And that, over time, has taken these ideas of newness and it's taken them and it's packaged them up, right? So what you see with modern pop artists now is they trot out all the cliches of what was shocking and new 50 years ago as a sort of um, almost like superstitious uh, ritual of I am an artist, so here I am being sexually provocative or you know um talking about you know issues that uh, our society shouldn't talk about challenging you know um, um stereotypes all that type of stuff which in the 60s was really important has now become a great big cliche all right and um, this has really been driven i think by the philosophy of constructivism that exists within postmodernism right because what postmodernism did uh, and he did a lot of things philosophically, is it questioned the idea of the author, right? It says there's no such thing as an author. People don't have an original thought. Everything is constructed. It's all socially constructed. All anyone's doing when they create art is just, you know, get, grabbing that from there and grabbing that from there and grabbing that, but they're just sticking it together in new forms. You can see this really influences uh, art. If you think of um, someone like William Burroughs, you know, creating pieces of text by just writing and then chopping it all up and rearranging it randomly, right? David Bowie then went on to create his lyrics in that way, you know, and I love the idea of randomness. I think it's an incredible thing, but it's that idea that the author, the author's not, not, not the person, it's not their creative intent that is making it. It's just this amalgamation of what's already culturally existed and then of course the postmodernists said that there was a meta-narrative there a, met a meta-narrative of power so when you look at the established arts it's just a meta-narrative of power which um, is inflicting that sort of supremacist view through its established art now back in the 60s the way you question that is by someone like Peter Brotzman screaming at you. It's, it's like tries to break it, okay? But of course, that idea now has become the mainstream. It's so embedded into our culture that it has become a dogmatic ideology, I think, right? Those things are no longer new. So how can you be new, right? So um, I watched the Glastonbury footage uh, last week. I watched Libby Cole. Uh, I thought he was fantastic um, and what impressed me is this guy is playing um, really interesting jazz. He's amalgamating it with modern ideas that have come from EDM, from techno, from drum and bass. Um, he's also bringing in a lot of ideas from postmodernism, sort of um, ideas. That, the, the, the meme, you see, the meme is, is, is really like a postmodernist idea. The meme as, an, as, a, as a piece of art is, is almost exactly like what Duchamp was doing 100 years ago, right? Um, it's sort of a found object. There's no author to it. Its uh, meaning is specific but not specific. It, 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 it questions the culture and often refers to the culture. Um, so Louis Cole is pulling all these things together. But what is the shock, I think, to jazz, to that jazz academy, the shock of Louis Cole is, is that he's on a normal stage playing to normal people. 
he is selling this sort of electric post British brew jazz to hundreds of thousands of people on stage and they're all jumping down because it's been presented in a way where there's a certain irony there okay so um, it's almost like the commercial appeal. I know the jazz world will go, yeah, Louis Cole's great, blah, blah, blah. But they, they, they don't like that, right? It's got vocals on it, it's got dance beats. Um, is it jazz? Well, it's, it's sort of, I can see a jazz influence there, but I don't know if it really is jazz. I mean, um, I, I mean, like, there, there's some licks there that I can see I derived from bebop, you know, and there's certain chord changes that are quite interesting. But I think the, the sort of metronomic, um, uh, trap that comes out of that sort of um, post machine dance music where everything is locked in place it's, it's not allowing the musicians to express themselves in the same way that Sonny Rollins was able to do with the acoustic jazz section there's so many you know all this stuff you can see that they're bulking at it they don't want to quite admit this person into the club Right, and I don't think Louis Cole wants to be in the club because anybody in the industry knows that once you get labelled jazz, it is commercial suicide. Right, so there's a situation when I was watching it, I was thinking, is 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 Louis Cole new, or is it just he's new because he's not new? That that was the question I thought today. Is it possible to be new? in the way that my generation perceive new. Um, is it possible to challenge in the way my generation perceives being challenged? Is there a massive cultural shift going on that the, 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 my generation that came out aesthetically believing that innovation was the most important aspect of art, is that thing in itself old news right is that something that um um reeks of the past okay um is the most challenging fact today in contemporary music is the complete lack of humanity the 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 um just blatant pushing of the accessible commercial button you know the simplest melody the simplest chord progression saying the most sort of banal thing that you can possibly say over and over again while the artist just jumps around pretending to be provocative but really just channeling a whole bunch of tropes that are now decades old right and the young people see that and they they don't look at it in oh my god this is new and challenging and they see it as being a post-modernist ironic take on their culture all right marcel duchamp was right now the art totally is with the people it's not even in the realms of rock music or cinema or pop music is it all right the real art is not art the real art is everyone's facebook page this is their instagram page it's their twitter it's those photographs of their dinner that people put up that's about <laughs> avant-garde 50 years ago if someone had put an exhibition so this is this is my dinner i photographed it every day here's a photograph of my dinner oh what is art is that is how is that it, it, it says something about consumption doesn't it it says something about how we really view ourselves in terms of what we eat you know the pride of presenting a, a well-fed meal and it really shows up the dichotomy against a western capitalist country that has enough food to eat and then these starving people in these poor countries and you see that dynamic the virtue signaling and at the same time the the um um uh, glorification of abundance right it's very easy for me to put an extremely artistic intellectual spin on my auntie's picture of a meat and two veg that she took when she went down to the old um, spoons the other day it's an interesting thought Maybe the new, com, the new art is completely somewhere else and it just doesn't seem new at all. And maybe we really are in a new cultural age. All right? 
Get rid of your records. People won't listen to music like that anymore. Stop watching films, you know. It's all boring anyway. Who wants to go and see the next Marvel tosh or the next Disney virtue singling rubbish? Who wants to see that? You could see the audience is not interested, right? They're not interested. Most of you probably now watch YouTube. You watch people like me, completely off grid, coming in and just saying whatever I want and talking about whatever I want, you know, and uh, obviously this film did not cost a hundred million quid. It cost nothing. It cost my time sitting here, a bit of editing time, and the worst bit was trying to find this CD in my collection. It took about 20 minutes. I'm not a well-organized person, you know. If I was well organized, they would be in alphabetical order. I have gone backwards and forwards over and over again. Where is it? Have I lost it? I kind of lost Machine Gun because this album was hard to get hold of in the 80s. I had to order it from Europe. It cost me a ton of money and I've probably only listened to it all the way through once because it's bloody unlistable. But I am so proud to own it. And I'm so proud to have been able to pay tribute to Peter Broatsman, the one of the great artists of the 20th century unlistenable angry great beard i've been i've been you know people have said you're going to say anything about peter brooks so i said what am i going to say i'm going to come on and say you know rest in peace peter brooks and talk about his life no one's going to watch that video so i have done the new postmodernist thing of burying a tribute inside this video now this isn't that clickbaity is it it's a little bit too intellectual for youtube the title's not going to be great when you put it on it's it's, it's only a few people will look at it it's, it's 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 all too artsy and fartsy the world's not about artsy and fartsy it's not about intellectual anymore right it's not about that anymore we're in a new age right we're in a new age where i could come on camera and talk to you about highly intellectual things but i know that you'll probably sit and listen to me telling you about how I found it hard to find this album today. And then when we finish the video and I hold it up, it's upside down. Oh, Andy, you're so postmodern. You're so ironic, right? You criticize these things, don't you? You criticize them, but you are all these things, aren't you? You are all that we all are. There's no meaning to anything. You're not postmodern, but there's no meaning to anything. You're just trotting out what everyone else has said, aren't you? That's where we're at at the moment. Oh, to be just in the simple place of just going into recording studio and just screaming on your horn, not having to think of all this stuff, just screaming on your horn until you've got no more breath in your body. Thank you, Peter Broatsman. Thank you. Right? Your time has passed. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you on the next one. Hey, everybody. This is your brother, Nardo Michael Walden. Once we bring that in, once we've got musicians in the studio with a proper big moustache and a big black glasses and a fringe and long hair, once we have those in, they're not going to be prettifying themselves with quantize and autotune and let's chop that bit out because I went a bit wrong there and let's stretch that bit in and make that right there and ringing up the bass plate. Have you got your bass part yet? Now I've only been spending three months in my bedroom recording it for you. Mm. Hi there. Hi there, L. If you want to make a soundtrack to your book and we'll call it Space Jazz, I've got all the equipment here and I'd be happy to do that. And everyone was going, yeah, great, let's do that then, chick. I want you to do that. You know, um, we'll get Tom Cruise and we'll get John Travolta. No, 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 don't worry about them. But what I was thinking, well, we could use Stanley Clark. Someone who really, really um, inspired me. His name is Andy Edwards. Bill Kaufman was born in 1948 and he's an Australian sailor. Mm. What does this album sound like? It sounds like really awful 80s pop music written by people who haven't got a clue about what pop music is with terrible production. That's what it sounds like. It's absolutely awful. It Mom! About 10 minutes. Mom! Mom! And I think, oh my God. My mom's pegged it. Mm. Nuno, I love you. Come on my channel for a chat. You went to Rick Beato, that's all great and good, you're right, but come and see me, come on here, 
right? Or at least put a message. If I got a message from Nuno Betancourt, I'm going back to my like late teen self now. If I got a message from Nuno Betancourt, it would be an, a, a fantastic thing. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a very intellectual jazz and progressive rock fan who studied music history and the cultural context. I, I, I am that, you know. I'm very serious. Mmm. Oh my God. Holger. If um, you really want to support me on Patreon, then please support me on Patreon, and the link is down below. Mm -hmm. Don't speak. God. Oh, are you still here, are you? Mm. Bloody hell, you're still watching. What are you watching for? I'm not, I mean, what am I doing? What am I doing that's so interesting that you're going to watch it, you know? You know, you know what I'm, I'm not tidying it up. I'm not going to tidy up. Nice sunny day. I'm relaxed. I've had a nice time chatting to you lot. Let's get back into this, shall we? Let's get back into this, shall we? So, yeah, for Valerie, wasn't it? Really nice. Oh, God. Oh, Sid, you naughty man. 